maybe, maybe you've heard, like me, that your ears and your nose never stop growing. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't like that thought. Frankly, my nose and my ears are big enough. They're just fine as they are. Maybe too big for some people's, you know, taste. I don't know. But I was reading in this little article in the Michigan Facial Surgeons Journal. Here's what they said. Bones stop growing after puberty, but cartilage, the plastic-like substance in our ears and noses, continues to grow. There's a happy thought for you. Not only does cartilage grow, but earlobes also elongate from gravity, which can make your ears look even larger. <laughs> There's an encouraging word for you this morning. You know, when I was about 16 years old, I finally figured it out that I was kind of done growing. I always wanted to be bigger than I was. I wanted to be that. I had a certain size in mind because I was all about playing basketball, and I felt like at six foot wasn't quite what it needed to be. I needed to be bigger, but, oh well, at 16 it stopped, and I was uh, six foot, and about 100 and whatever pounds I was at 16. I don't remember what that was. I was pretty, I was pretty much of a rail, I could just tell you that much. And, and while I was disappointed that I stopped growing, it was just a fact of life. And now I've learned, now I've learned that my ears and my nose, and hopefully my waist, you know, will not, hopefully they, they will, and this will, you know, you know what I'm saying. We don't want to go there. Yet, there is a part of my life that I don't want growth to stop. And that's the life of the Spirit, the godly life that I have the privilege of living. I don't want that to stop growing. And I, and I hope that you would join me in that pursuit. In fact, that's what deep roots and strong life is all about, is getting our roots deep, deeper and deeper and deeper so our life is strong, and we provided, I, I trust, tools and helps that can, can assist us in this as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And over the next seven weeks, this is week number two, we kind of introduced it last week with the idea, or rather the, the understanding, is that God has provided everything that we need for a life of godliness, everything. There's nothing left out of that. And now for the next seven weeks, after today, we're going to talk about virtues. And these virtues are added one on top of another. Now, the, here's, here's what is important to understand. Most scholars believe that the order in which the virtues are listed isn't as, isn't as important as the virtues themselves. That's a secondary part. What is primary is when we add one virtue to another, hear this carefully, when we add one virtue to another, our spiritual lives will grow. One more time, when we add one virtue to another, our spiritual lives will grow. Our roots will go deep and our lives will be strong. That's just the assurance of the word of God. We can be absolutely confident that if we will add virtue upon virtue, our lives will grow. Look with me, if you will, to 2 Peter chapter 1. This is our passage of scripture, and I want to, I want to strongly strongly encourage you to read this passage of scripture on a regular basis. In fact, kind of, if you can, read it every day, or at least one time a week, all of it, verses 3 through 11. Get this deep into your heart. Chapter 1, verse number 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Faith in Jesus, which brings us into the family of God. This is a really important statement as we begin. Faith in Jesus, which brings us into the family of God, is the foundation of all other qualities of the Christian life. Let that sink in a moment. All other qualities of our life in Christ start with faith. Start with faith. And it's really interesting the way that Peter has crafted with the, with the assistance of the Holy Spirit what he says. He begins with faith and he ends with the greatest virtue of all, love. 
These are the bookends, as it were, of this incredible godly life. Look, Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, Paul says, The righteous will live by faith. Ephesians 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not for, of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Hebrews 11, verses 1 and verse 6. Now, faith is the confidence. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. You see how incredibly important faith is to our journey with Christ. G. Campbell Morgan, great pastor and writer, he says, Faith is the root principle, and it must be developed until it reaches its ultimate byproduct of love. You hear that? One more time. Faith is the root principle, and it must be developed until it reaches its ultimate byproduct, love. You see how Peter has put it? He starts with faith. Add to your faith and all of these virtues, and then it ends with love. You see, all of this will develop into the greatest virtue of all that God has made available to us in Christ, which is love. And Peter lists, as before he lists the virtues... He makes, or before he starts with faith and then we'll list the virtues, he starts with three statements that I want you to grab onto this morning by way of introduction. The first one is this. Peter says, for this reason. For this reason. That is a really significant and profound statement. God has made everything available for us to have a godly life. And that, that should prompt us to add to our faith, okay? Interestingly enough, this is the only time the Greek word is translated here for this reason. It's the only time it's used in the New Testament. It's never used again, only here. That, word, that phrase, add to your faith. For this reason, for this reason, it is a little bit like saying, here's the why... We're doing what we're doing for this reason, because of. I reference this guy a lot, Simon Sinek. I know I do, but I love, I love the concept that he has brought forward when he talks about starting, starting with why. And here's a phrase that I want you to catch that he wrote. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. Now look at this phrase. And what you do simply proves what you believe. What you do simply proves what you believe. I might suggest that as we pursue, as we add to our faith, it shouts loudly to those in our circles of influence. When we are adding to our faith, when we are growing our faith in God, when our godly life is increasing, when it is growing, it shouts loudly to those around us. James 3 verse 13 it says, if you're wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Peter would say as well, 1 Peter chapter 2, live an exemplary life in your neighborhood so that your actions will refute their prejudices, then they will be won over to God's side. You see, for this reason, for this reason, God's given us everything we need, and for this reason, we're to add to our faith. The second phrase that Peter speaks is he says, make every effort. So for this reason, make every effort. Are you familiar with the phrase, no stone unturned? No stone unturned. Where did it come from? Well, it actually uh, is about a general who lost a battle. Now, uh, listen, this is really cool. Is an ancient Greek legend about a general who buried a large treasure in his tent upon defeat. Okay? Those seeking the treasure consulted the Oracle of Delphi, who told them, who advised them to move every stone to find it. That's where the, that's where the phrase originates. No stone unturned. I love that story as it relates to our topic today. Adding to your faith, hear this carefully, adding to your faith should be a treasure so highly regarded that you will leave no stone unturned. You will make every effort to add to your faith. You're going to work at it with everything you have. 
Peter says it, make every effort. And when we do, there is an incredible reward. Peter says it this way. First Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Do all these things, and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We exert so much effort for so many things that mean absolutely nothing in the realm of eternity. Couldn't we give everything that we have? Could we leave no stone unturned in the pursuit of growing our faith? Because when we do, there is a treasure available for us, both now in this life and in the life to come. The third phrase is, Peter says, add to your faith. (coughs) Excuse me. The word translated add to is originally a theatrical term. And it meant, originally of a generous giver who would provide finances or money to stage a production. That was the original intention of add to. When Peter was writing, by the time he was writing, it just literally was referenced or uh, would be considered as being generous, as being generous. And that is a significant thought. The idea is that as we cooperate with God, as we cooperate God with God in adding to our faith, we will never consider the price to be paid. Because God is acting in our behalf generously. When we're adding to our faith, it's all in. It's everything I got. I am not going to consider any sacrifice too great. I'm not going to consider any cost. I am all in. I'm going to do whatever it takes to grow my faith. I wonder, I wonder if we're willing if we're willing to go all in. I wonder if we're willing to add to our faith as generously as we possibly can. There is no room in adding to our faith for a lackadaisical, complacent, self-satisfied, or cheap approach to a growing faith. A.W. Tozer, he wrote this. He said, complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Most of Most of my experience in growing faith, there's probably just a bit of complacency, of self-satisfied. Here's what I mean. I'm okay where I'm at. I got enough of God to get me into heaven, and I'm good. I pray that is not what's on your heart and mind. There needs to be more in our pursuit of faith. We are to what? We're to what? Make every effort to add to our faith. There's no room for complacency. God so generously has given to us through Christ and everything we need to live a life of godliness. Why do we just say, I'm just going to settle for this? No, we shouldn't. It should be an all-in approach. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13. So then, my dear ones, just as you've always obeyed my instructions with enthusiasm, not only in my presence, but... Now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. That is, look at this, that is cultivate, cultivate it, bring it into full effect, actively pursue spiritual maturity with awe-inspired fear and trembling using serious caution and critical self-evaluation to do anything that might offend God or discredit the name of Christ. For it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively a work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, creating in you the longing, the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. Praise God. So, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. So what I'd like to do for just a few moments is I want to just share with you four things that I trust will just set you on fire. Set you on fire. Light a fire in you to grow your faith. Four things. First, a growing faith is possible. It's possible. Now, sometime, some years ago, uh, I just, I had to come to some point of understanding and agreement. You ready for what it is? It is impossible for me impossible for me to dunk a basketball. Can't do it. Can't do it. It is impossible for me 
to play in, in the NFL. I cannot do it. It's not possible. It is impossible for me, one more impossibility, for me to go to Mars. Now, there are some people that all of those things are possible. That, but it's not me. It's not me. And so there are times that I look at certain things and I say, that's not possible for me. And you may do the very same. But I want to tell you this morning, growing your spiritual life, maturing in faith, becoming a more godly person is not one of them. It is absolutely possible for you and for me to grow our faith. It is not something out of the realm of possibility. There is only one thing that stands in the way of you and me growing our faith, and it's our will. It's our will. Will we grow our faith? But will we take the initiative to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Sinclair Ferguson, Sinclair Ferguson wrote this. He said, spiritual growth depends on two things. First, a willingness to live according to the word of God. Second, a willingness to take whatever consequence emerge as a result. It's the matter of the will. Will I grow my faith? If we can answer this morning that question, will I? We answer in the affirmative. We say yes, then it's possible for us to not just live a godly life, but to grow a godly life for the honor and glory of Jesus. You and I can grow our faith. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. God wants us to grow up. Let me just stop there. God wants us to grow up. i got to say it one more time. God wants us to grow up. Because there are so many benefits and blessings in growing our faith. He goes, to know the whole truth and to tell it in love. Like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God and robust in love. It's possible for us to grow our faith. Oswald Chambers, I love him. He says, spiritual maturity is not reached by the passing of years, by, but by obedience to the will of God. There is the key. We simply push against being obedient to what God's word reveals. It could very well be we open God's word and we say, ah, now can I get to another place because this one's just a little, you know, a little too serious. Will. It's according to our will. A growing faith is possible. Second, a growing faith is necessary. It's necessary. Growth is the only evidence of life. The only evidence of life, said John Henry Newman. And he's absolutely correct. Growing is, growing is just part of our life. It's necessary. It's necessary. Henry Drummond, he says he wrote, if a person doesn't exercise their arm, they develop no biceps muscle. And listen, and if they do not exercise their soul, they acquire no muscle in their soul, no strength of character, no vigor of moral fiber, nor beauty of spiritual growth. Man, that's, that's a stunning statement. We develop no moral character it's when we're not growing. We, we wonder why we continue to struggle and struggle and struggle in the same things over and over again. Could it be that our faith is just stagnated? That we have become complacent and self and self-sufficient. I hope that's not the case. Second Peter chapter one verse eight from the message says, "With these qualities active and growing in your lives, no grass will grow under your feet." I like that. No day will pass without its reward as you mature in your experience of our Master Jesus. Without these qualities, you can't see what's right before you oblivious that your old sinful life has been wiped off the books. That's really good. It's really good. I am really grateful 
I'm really grateful that Marcy and I have seven, seven grandkids. We're uh, four, boy, four girls and three boys. They are just delightful. I mean, they're just delightful in every way. And probably to each one of them, I have said something along this line to them. Stop growing. There's a reason. Because at that particular moment, they're so stinking cute. And what's really cool, if they're really small, I can just give them back to their mom and dad. They have to take care of them. I don't have to do it. You know, it's an option for me, which is great. But, that, and you know, we all, underst- we all understand that. The reality is I want them to grow. I want them to experience everything that every season affords them. There's no question. And to grow into that next season is absolutely necessary. My desire for you is that you would grow. My desire for you is that a year from now, in February 2024, I will look out across this audience and I will see you in a different place than I see you now. Not because of me, but because of the initiative you have taken, because you have, you have absolutely made a decision that I can grow my faith and it is absolutely necessary and I will do everything I can to be more like Jesus. I want you to grow because I want you to experience the amazing joy of growth at every season, in every place. Because sometimes... At times it will be difficult, but even in the midst of that, great things God does in our lives. Hebrews 6, verse 1. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. 1 Peter 2. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So growing faith is possible. A growing faith is necessary. Also, a growing faith is gradual. It's gradual. I mentioned last week that Marcy and I had the privilege of traveling to the UK. We, you know, I'm, I'm about 85% from the islands of Britain, and that's just what, you know, British, Welsh, Irish, Scottish, it's all here. That's why I should never be out in the sun anywhere. I need to live in the fog and the rain all the time because my skin does not do well with sun, although I love sun and don't like that kind of weather. Anyway, I, I digress. While we were there, we did a lot of really fun things. One of them we did was visit various cathedrals all through the UK. Had a great time. And we saw this cathedral, and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, Canterbury. This is Canterbury. And it is a magnificent structure. There's no, there's no way around it. It is just a magnificent structure. Did you know that it took, it took builders 900 years to complete it? <laughs> not, not to get that 900 years. Many generations of builders never saw the finished product. But you know what was happening the whole time they were building? It was growing. It was gradual. Until now, there is an extraordinary edifice to the, that's dedicated to the glory of God and the worship of Christ. In much the same way, you and I are building our spiritual house, and it takes time. We are, you might say it this way, we are somewhat obsessed with instant. There's no other way to say it. We're just obsessed with instant. Rick Warren said, becoming like Christ is a long and slow process of growth. And that's okay. It may frustrate us, but it's okay that it takes time. We, we shouldn't be upset about that. We should just understand that that's the natural part of growing our faith. It takes time. It's a process. It's a lifelong pursuit. But the benefits? Let me explain it to you like this. First John chapter number 2, verse 12. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome 
the evil one. Do you see the different uh, levels, as it were, or stages of life? You see three stages of life. Young men, fathers, and what? Older men. Okay. Many scholars believe that really this speaks of these various stages of spiritual life and spiritual growth. That we have the newest Christians, those who are just coming into faith. We have the growing Christians, and then we have those who are more mature. The fact is that the that growth of, in our godly life is a gradual process. It is not something that happens overnight. Don't be discouraged or downhearted as to where you may find yourself at this moment. Keep moving. Take initiative. Be aggressive. Do the work. Because at each stage of growth of faith are great things to be experienced. From the newest, from the newest point of faith to those who are mature in the faith, there is blessing and amazing experiences, amazing life in the midst of all of that. You see, we're consumed with fast. We're just consumed with it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to confess right now. Wow. I'm going to go have a burger for lunch today. And I know where I'm going. I'm going to Freddy's Steak Burgers. And I'm also going to get a frozen custard. I'm going all in. Okay. Why do we do things like that? Because I can get it fast. Okay. We like fast food. We do. We, we just do. Why? Because it's fast. And I think that speaks to someone of our culture, that we are just overwhelmed or consumed with things that are fast and instant. And so we come to faith in Christ and we immediately believe, that, oh, we got this and, and next week we're going to have it all dialed in. I'm gonna, it, it, no. This is a lifelong process. Irwin Lutzer writes, he says, there are no shortcuts to spiritual maturity. It takes a long time to be holy. How true it is. How true it is. And finally, number four, a growing faith is observable. Is observable. I'm, this is morning, I guess a morning of confessions. I'm going to make another one. Here we go. When I was uh, in the 1970s, I looked different than I do today. There you go. I had, I had really dark hair. I had a lot of hair. A lot of hair. And it was extraordinary. Thick. I could see without glasses. It was great. I had no wrinkles on my face. It was just a marvelous season. And now at the ripe old age of 39, everything has just fallen apart. Um, here, here's the thing. If I were to show you a compilation of photographs from the time that I was, let's just say starting high school, and it's from now, you would see an observable difference in me. I, I could say the same about you. I can't say that about Marcy. She looks just like she did when she was in high school. There's just something not fair about that. I'm happy for her, but I look at myself and I'm going, man, what happened to this guy? I'm, I'm different. Now, that's okay. It's just, part of, it's just part of life. I get it. You know something? Your spiritual life should also be observable, where you are growing. People should notice that you are not the same as you were before you came to faith in Christ. Am I, am I right? You, you literally have a whole different personality, a whole different look, B.C., and now you are living in this life after you have received Christ. There should be, but that should not just stop having come to faith. It needs to continually progress, and we need to continually look more and more like Jesus every day. Can I get an Amen. Something to keep in, more, keep in mind. Let's not confuse, let's not confuse inner transformation and outer display. Let me explain it this way. Mark chapter 12. Jesus also taught, beware of these teachers of the religious law. For they like to parade around in flowing robes and receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces. And how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head table at banquets. Yet, they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be more severely punished. You see, our lives should reflect 
the character of Christ. That is an inner quality of love, joy, peace, patience, etc. And, and, and how it's shown, it's not just the matter that we wear these long and flowing robes, that we just look the part on the outside but have absolutely nothing. We're bankrupt on the inside, and that's what Jesus is saying. He called them later on. He says, you guys are like whitewashed walls. That's, that's as good as it gets. This is as good as you are because there's nothing on the inside. The transformation of your life internally will express itself externally. We don't put on the, the trappings of righteousness to be seen or understood as. We just live a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And I will tell you that is observable. Those are qualities that people want to see. And they do see when we live accordingly. John 13, verse 35, your love for one another will prove to the world, you're my disciples. First Timothy 4, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers. Look at this. In speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. Don't neglect your gift. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Isn't that fascinating? One final thought this morning as we close. When we add one virtue upon another, our spiritual lives will grow, our roots will go deep, and our lives will be strong. Let's grow our faith.